Hello, welcome to Pools for Faith. Very nice to be with you. Just excuse me while I check everything is coming through. Just excuse me. Good, we have sound, we have video. Nice to be with you. I want to think with you today about the life of St John of the Cross, wonderful saint to reflect on. And just to remind you why I'm doing this in case you missed part one, I want to speak about the spirituality of the Carmelites, Carmelite spirituality, speak about it in a very personal way, but just to, to do a bit of history before that. So there's a video, a session about St. Teresa of Avila. I'll put a link to that in the video description here. There's this reflection on St. John of the Cross, and then part three is going to be my own slightly more personal reflection on Carmelite spirituality and what it means to us today. But this is just his life, in case you don't know very much about him. And to remind you, as always, when I'm speaking about the saint, I'm simply reading through and and um, sharing some of my own thoughts about the text, the life story that's in Butler's 12-volume Lives of the Saints, that wonderful resource about the saints. St John of the Cross. Priest Carmelite, doctor of the church, born in 1542, died in 1591. I'll try and, well, I won't even try and pronounce this. Gosh, my Spanish is appalling. Juan de Iepes y Alvarez, something like that. John, born in Fontiveros between Avila and Salamanca in 1542. So he's not far from Avila, where St. Teresa is from. His father was well off, but then married a poor young woman. His family disowned him. So the family, as John was growing up, was, was not well off. The father had been abandoned by his family. They were struggling to make ends meet. And very sadly, his father died when John was just a baby, a year old leaving his mother, Katerina, in poverty with three small sons. So just heartbreaking poverty. There was a period of great hardship. One of the brothers died. John eventually was sent to an orphanage in Medina del Campo. And he was taught to read and write and he was cared for. But here we go. John, he knew suffering. He knew poverty. He was an orphan. At 14, he did an apprenticeship with a carpenter and a printer, very practical trades, didn't get on very well, but he ended up as a teenager being a nursing assistant in a hospital outside the city. And he developed a real love for the sick and the poor and, and a, a willingness to do anything for anyone, to take on the most menial tasks. He washed and cleaned and bandaged the patients he was great with them. He sang them songs and made them laugh. He was much loved for his, his practical care and his skills, but just his humanity and his love for the sick and his willingness to be present with the sick and not to, to hide and run away. He caught the eye of the administrator of the hospital who saw his intelligence and his, his goodness. So this administrator sent him to the Jesuit college when he was 17 with the hope that he might be ordained a priest and come back to the hospital as the chaplain. He studied with the Jesuits, well, at the Jesuit college for four years, but more and more there was a desire growing within him for the monastic life. So this is just another little thought to take away from John. Clearly, he became the great Carmelite friar, but his vocation journey was complicated family life, not finding the right workplace, ending up doing something he didn't particularly want to at the beginning, that being cut short, opportunities for a vocation in this direction, something else calling him and taking him in another direction. It wasn't tidy and it, it gives us hope, I hope, if you're feeling that the road is a little bit twisted and turning that you're on. One night, with this in his heart, he knocked on the door of the Carmelite Priory of Santa Anna and asked for the habit. And the Carmelites accepted him and he was 
given the name in his profession of John of St. Matthias, and he was sent to the University of Salamanca, which was one of the great, great universities of Europe, probably the greatest center of theology in Spain. John worked really hard. So just this was a great time of intellectual growth and growing in faith and in his Carmelite vocation. But he was, he was uh, in one sense, an unusual character. He was so focused on his studies. He, he just had a great desire for solitude and simplicity. And it, it said that he wasn't popular with his fellow classmates because he just wanted to study and he didn't like it when they were messing around and singing stupid songs and playing practical jokes. He was quite serious, basically. He was ordained a priest in 1567, so the age of 25. He went home to say his first mass. His mum was there. What a joy. And while he was there, the prior of the Carmelite house, so this is in Medina in his home, arranged for him to meet the great Teresa of Avila. And again, I spoke about her a couple of days ago, and there's a link to her life in the video description if you want to read more about Therese, Teresa. They're in really different generations. I forgot exactly how much older Teresa is than John, but she's older than him. She's this, by this stage, she is this great visionary reformer who has, I've already gone into this, so in a sentence really, who's tried to reform the, the life of the Carmelites to get back to the original simplicity of the Carmelite vision against the lackness, the laxness, and the kind of worldliness and mediocrity that had afflicted both the female and the male branches. And she'd, be given a, she'd been given a mandate to reform not just the female houses, but, but the male houses as well, some of them at least. And she was looking for friars who would support her vision of reform and simplicity. So she met with Antonio, the prior of the house in Medina, and then John, and they were both interested in following her, following her example and helping her reform. The strictness of the poverty, the disciplined life, and these two men, the older Antonio and the younger John, joining St. Teresa in her mission of reform. So Teresa said that she'd been given a friar and a half, a friar and a half, maybe speaking about the age difference, the elderly Antonio and the young John, but also referring to his height. He was very short. He was maybe about four foot, 10, 11, five foot at the most. He finished his theology at Salamanca, then joined Antonio in a small house in the town of Duruelo. Again, pronunciation, forgive me, Duruelo, just five miles from Avila, not far. And he adopted the discalced habit. So discalced means without shoes. So the calced Carmelites were the unreformed, the discalced were the reformed Carmelites, and John became part of this movement movement of reform, the, the, the discalced Carmelites, and he took the name Fray Juan de la Cruz, Friar John of the Cross. In 1570, John was sent to be rector of a study house. He suffered greatly in his spiritual life. There were, there were long periods of, of darkness and grueling temptations. It was a difficult time for him spiritually, but it was partly what formed him. And it, it, it meant that he was going through the, the journey of the spiritual life himself, not just speaking about it from books. And we'll come on to this in a minute, but really living through the great journey of the spiritual life as, as, as the soul is purified, as, as the Christian grows closer to the Lord. In 1571, remember, still a young man, Teresa was sent to be prioress of the unreformed Carmelite con convent in Avila. And John 
still very young, was sent to be its spiritual director and confessor. So this is the enormous Carmelite convent that Teresa first entered in her 20s. She went off to found San Jose, a reformed Carmel, but now she's sent back into her, her old unreformed Carmel to reform it, and she wants to take John with her. So they worked together very, very closely. It's been said that they, they were they were very close in their work and their mission, even though they were very different in age and temperament. And so there was a kind of a, a huge respect and appreciation. But it, it, it has to be said there wasn't a sort of easygoing brotherly, sisterly relationship with them. Teresa was practical, wanting to get things done. John was this contemplative who was often lost in his thoughts and his his studies and his prayer, and often vague about details and practicalities. But she appreciated his wisdom and the importance of his role there as a confessor. Here things got difficult. The unreformed Carmelites were becoming more and more resistant to the reforms that Teresa and John were wanting to bring in. Teresa was protected by the king, but John was not. So the Carmelites, the unreformed, appealed to the, the general of the Carmelites to try and get him to deal with the reformed Carmelites and put them in their place and stop them bothering the unreformed Carmelites. John, I mean, it's extraordinary to think about now. We can't imagine something like this happening. Well, maybe it does happen in some places of the world. But the tensions and the difficulties and the rivalries became so strong that John was captured and imprisoned in Medina by the main Carmelite order, the unreformed group. This is 1575-76. He was only freed on the instructions of the papal nuncio. So this is the, the Vatican representative, if you like, interfering with Spanish politics and religious life. But the nuncio died. The, the nuncio's successor was on the side of the unreformed Carmelites. And in 1577, John was captured again and imprisoned in the Carmelite Priory of Toledo. This is the famous story, the, the months, was it eight or nine months? I've forgotten. But nearly a year of a terrible, terrible experience of imprisonment for John. And just to take seriously the very accurate historical accounts we have from people who knew John and knew what he went through. This wasn't like house arrest, where he was just living the life of a friar and told not to go out. This was a serious, dangerous, life-threatening experience. He spent most of the time in total darkness. There was a tiny slit in the window. It wasn't even a window. There was a slit in the wall about two and a half inches thick, wide, like this. High, high up, not facing outside, but facing an inner corridor. With a walkway on the other side, a corridor. So the light in his cell was incredibly dim. There were only a few short periods in the day when he could read the divine office. When, when the sunlight was coming into the corridor and bouncing off through this tiny skylight and giving him a tiny bit of light. Even with the light of coming into the room, he couldn't read. He had to stand on a stone or a, a bench or whatever, hold his breviary up to this little slit in the wall so that he could just about read his breviary in those few moments of light. The cell was freezing in winter and stifling in the summer. And he stayed there, here's the amount of time I'd forgotten, for eight and a half months. Eight and a half months in a tiny, cold and then stifling cell with no light. Most of the time he had no communication with anyone but his friar jailer, who, who treated him with such disrespect. He was half starved. He was full of, the, the cell was full of vermin and, and all over his clothes and his skin. He was regularly flogged. Again, it's unbelievable today. He was flogged, beaten in the chapter 
in the the community of friars to force him to change his mind and to leave the reformed group and to join the the Carmelites, the unreformed Carmelites. And he bore the marks of his flogging, his torture for the rest of his life. He was lied to. He was told that St. Teresa was in prison, that he would die in his cell. He was constantly afraid of being poisoned. He had no means of reading, nothing to read or write beyond his, to read beyond his breviary. And apart from the last few weeks, when a, a kinder jailer was given to him, he had nothing to write on, no materials and no candle. And he was plagued, it, as often happens in difficult circumstances, with a lack of confidence and with doubts. He was doubting whether it was really true that he should follow the reform. Maybe he was wrong to disobey the superiors of the unreformed order. Maybe he was becoming disobedient. Maybe he was in danger through this disobedience of losing his soul. All the reassurance that he might have got from Teresa or trusted friends, it just disappeared and, and he was plagued by self-doubt and anxiety. It's got a lot to say to us today when we're struggling, when we're alone, when things are difficult, when we're trying to follow a path that we believe is right in our conscience, but, but it's not clear to us or to others and even to our own thinking sometimes. What St John of the Cross suffered. But again, another thought for us, it was in these conditions of incredible anxiety and suffering and privation that John was led to his deepest spiritual insights and that he composed some of his most profound spiritual poems and some of the most profound writings of Christianity and of any religion. Finally, it ended in August 1578. He was determined to escape and he'd finally found a way. He managed to loosen the lock on his door there were two small rugs in his cell and he tore them into strips to make a rope. It's like some kind of World War II movie when they're escaping from prison or something. He climbed out of the prison by night, descended down the high walls of the prison, out the high walls of the priory on this makeshift rope. Eventually, with with the help of the Virgin Mary, he was constantly praying to her. He found a way over another wall and down to the city walls and to the river Targus below. He was near death. He staggered barefoot and exhausted through the narrow streets of the city. He found his way eventually to the house of the reformed, discalced nuns, the nuns of St. Teresa the chapel that was in the same town. He came, he came to meet them. They were coming out of the chapel. He asked to see the mother prioress. And the mother prioress, recognising that he was in danger of death and that he was near collapsing, called two nuns to help her. And this is a lovely little bit of the story. You can imagine how strict enclosure is anywhere for religious people brothers and religious sisters, but especially in 16th century Spain. The enclosure, meaning that only the sisters, the, the sisters were allowed into that area of the monastery that was enclosed and no one else could go in. It was absolutely fundamental to the life of the convent. But the sister prioress was so clear of what needed to be done and, and the danger to St John's life that she opened all three doors of the enclosure in order to take John into the enclosure inside, which was breaking the rules and at great risk to her reputation and the reputation of the convent. And she used the excuse of St John coming to hear the confessions of the confession of a needy sister. So it wasn't a lie. I'm sure a sister said, I need my confession to be heard. But John went into the enclosure for the sisters to care for him, but under that heading of a priest coming in to hear the confessions of the sister, the sisters. They tended to his wounds. 
He could hardly eat. He was given a lovely little detail here, stewed pears with cinnamon, because that's all he could eat. When the friars and the police, this was a, a public event, came searching for him, the mother prioress refused to let them in. They searched the church, the outer part of the house, but they didn't dare to violate the enclosure. It's a form of sanctuary. And after they'd gone, John went into the church and began to dictate his poems. Some of them he had managed to write out in his last weeks when he had this notebook, but some of them were carried in his head and he was desperate, even in this state that he was in of, of recovery and collapse, desperate to put into writing and into words the poems and the inspiration that he'd been nurturing. In the morning, a canon of the cathedral, who was friendly to the reformed Carmelites, took John under his protection. And when he was able to escape from Toledo to, to safety and to recover, he was free again and in better health. He was sent as prior to the house of El Calvario near Beas as a confessor to the Discalced Nuns. He continued to write his poetry for some time. He was asked how he wrote his poems, and he said, sometimes God gave me the words, and at other times I sought them. He was a scholar and a contemplative and a man of prayer, and he dreaded administrative responsibilities, but he accepted a number of tasks just as his duty. He was head of a college in Baeza, he was prior at Los Martires in Granada, he was deputy vicar general of the reformed Carmelites. He would have been very happy just to pray and meditate in the mountains. He said once, for the love of God, let me be, for I am not fit to deal with people. He lived very simply. He loved to do menial tasks above all, but he was faithful to his duties as a prior, an administrator, a priest. And in these moments, he was writing his poetry and his great prose writings, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, The Dark Night of the Soul, The Spiritual Canticle and The Living Flame of Love. After Teresa died in 1582, there was mounting opposition to the reform. So things didn't get easier over time. In many ways, they got worse. Ten years later, when there was such resistance to the form and to John himself, in 1591, he was stripped of all his offices and sent to the remote friary of Penuela as a simple friar. He had forecast, he predicted that he would be, quote, taken and thrown into a corner like an old kitchen cloth. People tried to collect evidence against him to... to attack him and, and besmirch his name. But it wasn't possible because he'd lived a life of such integrity, but he was very badly treated in many different places and even by the prior of the, the monastery that he was sent to. He suffered greatly, but carried this in his heart and responded with humility and courage. He died on the 14th of December, 1591, and this is when his feast day is today. The poems and the prose works, the writings of St John of the Cross have been translated into so many different editions and you can read them and I'm not going to speak about them directly next time but I'm going to speak about the vision of Carmelite life. First of all and at the heart of everything there are his love poems but of course they're about the love of the soul for God, using the framework of the romantic and the biblical imagery of, of the love between the lover and his beloved. The most famous poem is the beautiful Dark Night, which describes how the soul goes forth under the cover of night to meet the beloved. And in that darkness comes face to face with the one that he loves. It's all about, in, in profound, mystical ways, 
simply the relationship of the Christian to the Lord, the relationship of the human person to God. So there are huge depths and, and such wisdom and and such delicacy and, and insight and rarification. and But at the same time, John's theology and poetry and writing is simply about our friendship with God and our love for God and his love for us. So it's inspired great mystics and theologians, but it's inspired ordinary people like you and me as well, who can pick up his poetry and taste something of it, even if we're not at his mystical heights. So here is the life of St. John of the Cross. Um, as I say, I don't want to go through all his works. I'm not going to go through all of his spirituality here. Did I give you the date of his death? Yes. He died in 1591, just to finish the dates, as I said. He was canonised, sorry, he was beatified in 1675, canonised in 1726, and declared a doctor of the Universal Church in 1926. Just... Um, a wonderful saint to get to know. I want to speak about Carmelite spirituality in the next session that we have together on Pause for Faith. Um, but just to encourage you to, to get to know John better, uh, if you don't get to the next video, to encourage you to, to read his writings so you can find um, some of his writings online. You can search for, for books online and, and buy what you need to. There are, there are endless books about the spirituality of St. John of the Cross. Um, wonderful um, insights, and people not just translating John, but trying to unpack what he's saying for us in contemporary ways. So I'll put one or two books about St. John and by St. John into the video description so you can look him up. And I encourage you, finally, to pray to him. Yeah, this is true for every saint, but just he's a powerful intercessor. And because of what he suffered humanly, just the, the huge, the suffering, the sickness, the, the isolation, the poverty, the losing his father, the bereavement, the, the scorn, just at so many levels, the suffering of St. John of the Cross. And above all, the journey of faith and the journey into prayer to encourage you to pray for him. So just whatever is in your mind and heart now, please turn to St. John of the Cross as an intercessor. But especially if you are suffering and especially if you are seeking help in the spiritual life, in prayer, in faith. John has gone through everything that you and I have gone through in our prayer struggles in our difficulties in faith, and I encourage you to pray for him for all your needs. So final prayer um, is not to St John of the Cross, is to pray for the Carmelites. Just what a wonderful, wonderful group of congregations, what a wonderful tradition. There are different Carmelite groups today, men and women, there are enclosed, there are non-enclosed, there are the friars, there are different kinds of friars. I'm not going to go into all the different branches. Um, there's so many varieties of Carmelite life, and I hope you can get to know the Carmelites. And please, wherever you are now, whenever you're watching this, pray for all the Carmelite men and women, pray for the congregations, the individuals, and pray that they will have many, many vocations following in the footsteps of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila. Very nice to be with you. Um, if you're watching live, we've got mass in half an hour. Thanks for sharing this time with me. God bless.